Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation. Top five reasons time series is the fastest growing database brought to you by Influx Data. I'd like to introduce you to our presenter. Katie Farmer is a developer advocate at Influx Data. Katie lives in Oakland, California with her husband and two dogs, at least one of whom talks to her about fun technical stuff. She loves to experiment with code, break stuff, and try to fix it. She learned to code at Turing School of Software and Design in Denver, Colorado, and it gave her the perfect chance to break stuff before she knew how to fix it. Uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Katie to begin the presentation. Katie? Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so, again, welcome, everyone. Um, I was going to say good morning, but I don't know where you are, so I hope you're having a good whatever it is that you're experiencing at the moment. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about time series, what it means um, in general, what does it look like as a database, and, and why we might need it. So as mentioned, I am a developer advocate at Influx, and I love talking about time series and databases. So I'm just going to walk you through some of the basics and um, I hope that you have questions. Please post them. I would love to answer them. So let's start here. And this is my welcome slide. This is really just for you all to enjoy since we already did the intros, but I am, I am relatively new to Influx. I've worked here for a little under six months, but the learning curve here is steep and also super fun. So <laughs> here's me and my lightsaber, and we are just gonna talk through some of the basics. So, what I'd like to start with is what is time series? Um, some of you might know, some of you might not, but, sorry. <laughs> uh, this code is not relevant um, if you're seeing what I'm seeing. I, uh, hello, little technical difficulty, sorry about that. Great. Okay. Sorry. We're all we're all settled. We just had a little little housekeeping to do. Uh, I do most of my presentations in person, as you can probably tell. But um, okay. So let's just talk. What is time series? So objectively, it makes sense that time series data is in time order, right? In the human world, we don't really have much of a choice. Time is a linear concept for us. But in programming and development, there are lots of asynchronous problems. There's unexpected and unpredictable and making assumptions about what order things happen in and when they'll be finished can be really dangerous. So here we're talking about data that has a natural time order, where time is not only relevant to our data, but it's a key point of its value. Time series data isn't just about things that happen in chronological order. It's about events whose value increases when you add time as an axis. So I hope that makes sense in general. What I, the characteristics that I have listed here are, one, it comes in high volume. One property of time series data is that it's suited for data where individual data points don't offer as much value as an entire data set. For instance, imagine a single shooting star. That makes you kind of like a Disney princess making a wish, right? 
that's a single event. It doesn't offer you a lot of value unless your wish comes true, of course. But if you think about a meteor shower, that's a forecasted, predictable event that has things like an expected duration and a single radiant point. There's a lot we can know about meteor showers based on trends in the past, and we can analyze the events for patterns, things like that. So we get way more value out of this data set than we do out of our single Make-A-Wish star. So we are... Now I want to go through a couple examples of what is and is not time series data. So let's start with what isn't time series data because I find sometimes starting with a bad example is easier for me to understand. So you'll notice on the left, I have my mood and cake. They are related, right? As you can see, my mood kind of increases as I approach cake. There's a couple dips in there. Those are just sugar crashes. I wouldn't worry about it. But what we're representing on this graph is, is relationship, right? My mood and cake kind of like are dependent on each other, but time isn't a factor at all here. So if you look at the one on the right, what we see here are times and cake consumption events. So what I'm talking about here is what time did the cake consumption event occur? And as they occur over time, what changes and what questions might we, ha might we have? So for example, you might say 6 a.m. is a little early for a cake consumption event. Katie, what happened? Now, if you're thinking from a systems possibility, you might say like, oh, that was some weird activity at a time I didn't expect it. Maybe I should investigate that. Or you might say, wow, that's a lot of um, cake consumption events between like 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. Uh, for me, if you looked at, let's say, a year's worth of data, you might say, man, that happens every like four months. That's weird. And that would be just like every time I remember how much I love cake. It's about once every four months. But, you know, these are problems we can investigate as we sort of look through data. So we are offered time, offers us value here. We say, yeah, this cake consumption event happened, but it's just as important when it happened as what happened. So why would we need to store these things in a time series database? Time series data is special. We just talked about how special it can be. But it's not just special in the unique data that it captures, but also in the ways that we interact with that data. With new types of data come new responsibilities. Time series data is evanescent and voluminous, which is to say, of course, that it just comes and goes very quickly and in great number. That calls for different considerations for storage and retrieval than other types of data. If you want to retrieve a user from a table in a relational database, for instance, something that was tracking my mood and cake, well, you can query by any number of attributes in your schema, right? You can do uh, the primary key, ID, last name, first name, uh, favorite member of Earth, Wind, and Fire, whatever you think is the uh, most valuable characteristic to query by. If you want to know exactly when your drone, which I, of course, have named Skynosaur, if you want to know when your drone sent its coordinates home, you can do that, but not without some trade offs. So, first, let's talk about scalability. Here's Skynosaur. It's a drone that I've clearly made. Uh, it should be real. But when we talk about scalability, it's, it's not something that we always understand, right? Scalability is one of those magical words that we hear often and is used correctly, like, I don't know, let's say 50-50, right? <laughs> Sometimes people just say it. Maybe they'll get more VC money, or maybe they mean it. Maybe they know what scale means, but out of context, it's, it's really hard to understand. Now, the general problem with time series 
and scale when you're not using a time series database is this. If our Skynosaur flies for 1,500 hours, that's the minimum number of hours for a commercial pilot's license, and you can see by the hat that he has his license now, then if he flies for 1,500 hours, we've already reached over a million data points for one device. Now imagine that the company that makes Skynosaur, Skynosaurus Rex Incorporated, they could have thousands of devices sending data home. So querying by timestamp would involve millions of rows of data in a relational database. And while that's certainly possible, it's not exactly going to be performant for you. So people often claim that SQL databases don't scale well, while no SQL databases do, right? But it was easier for me to understand in terms of acid versus base. Maybe you've heard of these uh, database principles. So let me just like unfairly summarize them here. Acid compliant databases are concerned with guaranteeing validity. Uh, data should be atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. That's what ACID stands for, right? Uh, while the base model allows us to give up some of those principles for the sake of speed or scale or whatever we want to pri prioritize. To decide which system works, we have to decide the main purpose of our database. If we don't care about durable data, we can write commands without flushing to the disk, meaning that data probably won't survive a reboot. But maybe we don't care. If we don't care about atomicity, we can shorten the duration that those data sets are locked. Time series databases balance the acid-base relationship by offering principles that suit time series data. So again, if that sounds pretty like obvious, right? Like time series databases are made for time series. But think about this, time series datable data is more valuable as a whole than as individual points, which we've talked about. So in that case, a time series database knows that it can sacrifice durability for the sake of a higher number of writes. If Skynosaur here sends data home every five seconds and we lost a few data points in that 1500 hours of flight time, our overall trends would still be intact. We would still be able to see all of Skynosaur's activity and be able to fill in the gaps with a, with a high degree of accuracy. So scalability in the case of time series means that a time series database specializes in a higher number of writes with eventual consistency, even across distributed storage. And that specialty means less worry for the people that care about that data, probably you. So you don't wanna to have to spend your time worrying about querying or storing. And that's sort of one of the things, uh, one of the problems that time series databases solve. So the next question of course is, is usability. Because if we build a specialty tool but it's impossible to use, then it doesn't do anyone any good. If all of our data lived in a secure, durable black box, we could breathe easy. Right? We, none of us would be worried about losing anything ever. But how we access that data can be just as important as its storage. Every database has a query language, and it's designed to access the contents as efficiently as possible. Now, keep that in mind, because as we mentioned earlier, time series data is special. So, I want to talk about how Influx sort of solves this problem. Interacting with our time series data should be easy. And the way we solve this here at Influx is that we focus on this, on this database. We built this performant, efficient, specialized tool. And when people liked it, we wondered how can we make this even easier? So what we have here is sort of our full tick stack. The tick stack stands for Telegraph, Influx, Chronograph, and Capacitor. Those are our four products. And essentially, InfluxDB is the heart. It was the first thing we built. Um, it was our first open source product. And it's sort of the thing 
that all of these other pieces were built to support and make easier. So Telegraph is our collection agent. Uh, basically, it serves as a pipeline for getting data from one place to another. You can collect and report metrics and events. Chronograph is our UI layer, which is part of what I think adds to the usability of Influx. Um, maybe many of you are like me and you're more comfortable in the command line. I like to just write my SQL queries there. I get the results back. It's great. Um, but, you know, for, for my boss or for, uh, you know, members who aren't necessarily on the dev team, that's not, that's not as easy. So it's important that the data always be accessible and usable. So chronograph is our way of saying, you don't need to like know how to build a perfect query. Here's how you can just interact with your data visually and, and get what you need without having to uh, worry exactly about, you know, the syntax of a of a query or exactly how to formulate it you don't have to do all this research you can just go in and click i want i want to see this measurement represented as a as a single stat something like that uh, finally we have capacitor which is our real time streaming data processing engine which i don't know about you but the first time i heard that I, it was just like question marks all over my face i was just like those are so many words um, but I've been working with Capacitor a lot lately, and I'm beginning to really understand the power of it. So Capacitor fulfills a few roles in this usability section. Um, and this isn't necessarily about ease of use, although it is certainly easy to use, but it's about meeting all of your needs. So Capacitor does a few things that I think are, are really important. One, it handles alerting. Uh, lots, there's so much activity in your systems, right? And the whole point is that you wanna know about it. So Capacitor allows you to set up threshold alerts, dead man switches. When you wanna know that something is like happening, when I wanna know when I've hit critical cake levels, like I would like an alert that says, Katie, please stop, you're hurting yourself right? But if I don't get that alert, then, then maybe I don't know. Um, you want your systems to say, hey, you've reached 90% CPU usage. Maybe it's a good idea for you to like offload some of this work, you know, uh, open up another container, whatever the solution is for you. Capacitor can also handle the actionable solution. So you can set it up so that you get an alert saying, hey, this is, Katie, you've reached critical cake levels. Then you can also write a custom script that tells it what you want to do in that case. So I could say, uh, I'm going to send an email to my mom and say, mom, I should have listened to you when you said to stop eating cake, but I didn't and I need help. And then she'll call me and maybe she'll like kind of, you know, yell at me for like 20 minutes, which is punishment enough for eating too much cake. In your case, you might say, you know, I've reached the beauty usage. It's at 90%, that's way too high, and you want to open up another virtual machine, another container, and just offload some of that, that can all be handled through Capacitor. You can also offer just like user-defined functions. So if you have something very specific you need to do, you can write a script, make a call to that API from Capacitor, and just, and then have the transformed results returned. And I want, I want to point out one other thing about the tick stack before we sort of move on, which is that uh, part of usability for me means modular tools. I don't generally like to use tools that offer me more than I need. So what initially drew me to sort of the, the tick stack is that it's built a little bit like Lego. You can use just the database. You can use... Um, InfluxDB and Telegraph. You could use all four. You can use InfluxDB and Capacitor. Like you don't need all four pieces to do every job. And, and I think knowing what you need and being able to use just what you need is an important part of like managing your processes and your time and your resources. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit more about our query language. Let me check my next slide. Nope. 
<laughs> I am I am going to go to my next slide because I like it. Uh, the last thing we're going to talk about, sort of in the in the context of the database, is specialty, right? So time series data is is like a double rainbow with a timestamp. It's just it's special, and so we build all these special tools around it. So I I want you to think about the army of Skynosaur drones that are sending data to Skynosaurus Rex headquarters. There are millions of data points to search if you want to find out a specific drone's location or its last event. But in InfluxDB, we now have a query language that's built for the task at hand. So we don't need to use uh, SQL in our relational database to try to query something time specific. We don't want to view data as it relates to other pieces of our schema in time series. We want to view data in the context of time. And the reason that we want to do this is so we can aggregate our data, set windows, and see trends. This is the value that we get from time series data. And if we don't have a query language that's built specifically to handle that, those queries can take up a lot of our time. So it's, it's not about whether other types of databases are capable of doing such a thing. It's about how we choose to spend our resources. Because the tools we use determine how we spend our time, how quickly we develop, how fast features get pushed. We have to spend time learning our tools in order to do our job well. So the time you have to spend learning that tool should be minimal. Uh, that's something that we totally understand and, and we pride ourselves on. Our, our CTO of Influx coins a phrase he calls time to awesome, which basically means it, it, you just shouldn't have to waste time installing and configuring. That should be the easiest part so that you can get to what you need to do. I think it's important that we just recognize that time series databases are optimized for time series data. And again, this doesn't mean that other types of databases can't do this. What it means is you should use the tool that's suited for the job so that you can spend your time doing what you do best. InfluxDB is efficient and performant and you can query the data in, in any way that's valuable and useful to you with sort of the minimum pain. Because we're focused on the solution. Um, and I, I like that idea. I heard our CTO say that recently, um, that we want to be solution focused and not problem focused. Problem focused is, oh, I have eaten too much cake. What am I going to do? Right? Whereas solution focused is having some foresight and saying, maybe I'm going to eat like one piece of cake. Or no cake, but I mean, that seems pretty unlikely. The solution is to eat less cake, not no cake, right? But we're very interested in doing this well. So we want to talk a little bit about like why, right? I mean, I, I've talked to you about like what it is and how you store it, but we still haven't talked about why. But you can see in these graphs, that there's sort of this popularity. Um, Time series is, is growing as a category. It's becoming really popular. Um, these are some numbers from DB engines, some of which I understand how they do it. If you want to ask them about how they get these numbers, then like please do. And it's a complicated algorithm. But you know, we're always really excited to um, to see new time series databases on the market, to see people really understanding the value of time series and we're also excited to be the best at it you know we want uh to solve problems like personally i don't i don't care that much about whether um we're the fastest or whether we can handle the most load what i care about is like am i solving my users problems Right, and so a big part of, of how I spend my time is figuring out what those problems are so that I can go to the development teams and say, you know, our users say we don't, we don't do this one thing well. How can we be better at it? And that's led us to a lot of really important optimizations in our database and the surrounding tools. 
So you can see here, this is our monthly growth. I'm, I mean, you know, graphs are impressive, am I right? But <laughs> on more seriously, we can, you can see the number of databases in use today, over 120,000. And it's not because um, people are just excited about time series, it's because they have a need for this. And I also think it's because at our heart, we have this open source philosophy. We want to solve your problems and we want you to have the tools to do it. So I do want to touch a little bit on the industries in which we see time series rising. First, we have connected things, right? IoT. So anything with a sensor is sending back time-stamped data. Think about Skynosaur. You probably haven't stopped thinking about Skynosaur, but bring, bring it to mind. Anything with a sensor, we want to know what the event was, um, what the, the value is at the moment, but we also want to know when it's happening. For instance, if Skynosaur suddenly stops sending data back, let's say there's a 10-minute window of no values. You have to ask yourself a lot of questions. IoT is based around these questions, right? The things we want to measure in IoT are usually change over time, right? So there are all these sensors you can put in uh, plants just to measure if it needs watering, which I think is amazing because I'm a plant killer. Uh, so we want to say, you know, what's the change in the moisture levels in this soil? which has sort of like fun use if you're just someone who needs to water their plants, but has like higher sort of impact environmental benefits as well. These are things we care about every moment, often down to the nanosecond. So IoT is was one of the first adopters of time series because of just the nature of the, the quantity of data sent back from connected things. They send back millions and millions of points, and the value in those points is the, the trends, not so much the individual points. Because if I stored every data point sent back by Skynosaur, while it would be very accurate, the load on storage and CPU would be intense. We don't have the disk space often to store millions and millions of points. What we want to do is keep the data for as long as it's valuable and then get rid of it. So that's why InfluxDB uh, comes with a retention policy. So every time your data comes in, um, you can set up a retention policy for, for different measurements, for different databases. You can say, I'm only interested in this for 30 days, because after 30 days, I no longer care about the moisture levels in the plant that I killed. <laughs> um, or you might just say, it's no longer relevant to me um, what, the, what the water levels were in this plant a month ago. I care about it today only. Right. Um, you might care about it for historical reasons, but um, there are ways for you to keep that data in aggregates and not as individual points to save yourself storage. We're also right on the edge of this adoption of monitoring processes. This is the whole DevOps industry. We want to know what's happening in our systems. Not just right now, but historically. We want to be able to make predictions. We want to be able to have that observability into systems health and, 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 and analyze our systems, right? So DevOps processes have, have been around for a while now, but time series is starting to become an important part of that for, for a lot of reasons. One reason is that a lot of the events occurring in our systems happen really often. And if you're thinking about something like financial data, that's important all the way down to the nanosecond. So 
Systems health is about monitoring events and metrics. And that, to me, that phrase, if you're saying to me, I have events and metrics that I need to monitor, then you're talking about time series. What we want to know is when an event occurs, what do you want to happen? Do you want an alert? Uh, do you want to, you want an email? <laughs> do you want your mom to call you? These are, these are problems that more and more companies are trying to address because they realize that when, when we don't monitor our systems, we don't understand them. And I, I think an important piece is that some people don't know what they're, that they're missing, right? So you add this observability layer, suddenly you have insight into your systems that you didn't have before. You understand sort of the, the layers that are happening. So <laughs> I'm gonna give you an embarrassing example of this, of my own personal projects, which is that I, I was running a, a Ruby on Rails app. It was sad and old and barely working. But I thought, what a what a perfect project to add some monitoring into. I could like get some good, maybe I'll just like write a blog post and show people how cool it is to monitor. And uh, I, was, I was very excited about this. So I, I instrumented my application uh, using a Ruby gem called Ruby metrics. And basically it just showed me some server activity. Um, are you getting in like a, a 200? Are you getting a 404? Are you getting a 500? Small things, number of page clicks, like just easy metrics that I thought would be a good introduction to observability. But as soon as I instrumented my application and started getting numbers back, I noticed that when I looked at the graph, it said that I had negative 800 views, which is confusing to say the least. I, I didn't even know what a negative number means in this context. Like that's how much people hated it. Or that's like just it was it was just baffling to me. I had no idea what this number meant. Um, and I spent a lot of time digging this hole, trying to figure out what negative eight hundred writes per second or reads per second meant. And and in the end, I sort of had this this epiphany, which was that it kind of didn't matter, right? It didn't matter exactly what it meant, what it what was important about it is were, were a few things. One, I knew something went wrong. And two, I knew that outside of that one event that happened at 8.04 a.m. dot 10 dot 001, all the way down to the nanosecond, was an anomaly. The rest of the time, the system was fine. So I spent all this time researching this problem that never happened again. And that's not a good use of resources, right? Like we talked about earlier. This is me using a tool the wrong way. So we want to monitor and we want to see patterns. And time series data is really good about showing us what, what are the trends. I investigated that one sad dip in reads per second for a few days before I realized that it was just a server restart. And that was really sad. That was that was maybe sadder than the whole thing. And then my cake consumption events went out the window. You 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 all understand what happened. So one of the other use cases for time series is these real time requirements. More and more we see whether it's IoT or systems monitoring or analytics, you don't care about data that's too old. You want to know about now. A lot for a lot of businesses, especially, it they need to know about problems or events as soon as possible. So think again about um, stock trading. Stock trading, uh, most of it isn't even done by humans anymore, right? It's mostly done by machines because they can react on the nanosecond level. So if we're talking about algorithms that can respond down to the nanosecond level, then 
what the traders need to know is also down to the nanosecond level. And the traders need to know about it as soon as possible. They need to follow the, the dips and sort of roller coaster of Bitcoin or what have you, bananas, I don't know. What do, what, what do things stock traders care about? I don't know, I'm, I'm not really keen on finance. But what I will say is that of course they need to know about it as soon as it happens. And we just are always approaching real time, right? A lot of times when people say real time, what they mean is near time. <laughs> but we're getting very close uh, to real time. If you're using Chronograph, our UI layer, you can see the changes in almost real time. There's just the tiniest bit of lag. And as soon as uh, you know, technology comes a little farther, then it will be real, real time. But as it is, I think we're doing a really great job. You can see the changes reflected right away. And that's a really important part of, of how we do business now. We're also talking a lot about data-driven businesses. This has more to do with sort of a change in business mindset and a little bit of that DevOps too, right? It's about in making informed decisions. So time series data gets through these aggregates from really accurate data that happened, you know, again, in let's say one minute buckets for a month but all the way down to the nanosecond level, you can keep track of, of everything your, um, your stocks did, let's say, and then use that information in your own algorithms to say, predict what might happen next month or forecast the weather, right? This data-driven business is smarter than it has ever been because data is more accurate. And time series data is a big part of of accurate data. It's data that maybe you want to keep and maybe you don't. Weather is always a really good example for me, right? So historically, we do see, right? We store weather data forever because they like to make the farmer's almanac. But if we're talking short term and you just want to um, know what the weather is right now, well, then you don't need to store yesterday's weather. Right, you just need to get your sensor readings now. But data-driven businesses keep that data, right? Or they use it to inform their decisions. Uh, and a lot of the data-driven businesses is in mobile, right? So I sometimes you don't know if it's a good idea, but you see an app and you're just like, I have to, I have to know. I have to know how this works. So any app that says, you know what, uh, it's a sunny day and I want to find people to play frisbee golf with, which is a real app. You can look for it. Um, <laughs> but if it's not a sunny day, how does it know, right? And it needs to know in pretty real time. So this is one example of a data-driven business, although clearly maybe not the most successful model of a data-driven business. Um, when we talk about them at scale, you know, you think more about Amazon or Google, these really big players that are built on top of data. Right, and what they need is a way to store it, aggregate it, sometimes query it, sometimes say like, you know, last year at this time, why were we making more money? And maybe some of our data can enlighten us about this. So there are a lot of factors that I think are, are the reason that time series is this fastest growing database. Um, I'd be interested to hear if anyone has any more ideas. So I am going to talk to you a little bit more about Influx data because I like it and I work here and they're nice. So uh, I'm going to share with you a couple of our use cases to kind of give you an example of not just time series data, but like this whole platform, right? Like who needs it and why? So I've got Tesla listed. Um, they use it for monitoring of the systems and sensors across solar and battery installations, providing greater visibility and insight into energy usage and maintenance. So this is like two out of the five, right? It's IoT and it's data-driven business. Sensors uh, collect the data for them, and then they use that data 
to like inform themselves and and make decisions and say are we using more energy does this machine need maintenance that's exciting i've also got uh b box we analyze over 70,000 hours of data every night, half a billion data points to produce alerts for our technicians. Having this real-time data in the cloud makes it possible to identify trends, usage patterns, and even detect problems before they exist. That's data-driven business, right? This kind of covers all of the categories. This is high volume data. This is alerting. This is real-time problems. And then lastly, I also have Comcast. InfluxDB has changed the way that we work and operate our platforms. We couldn't support our services without it. So this isn't exactly you know, an example of their use case, but I wanted to stress how using Influx and this time series platform can, can change the way that you work. So what now? Download InfluxDB. And all, the, the whole stack, Telegraph, Chronograph, and Capacitor, it's open source, so it's free. You can go get it from our website. Uh, it takes five minutes. That's the time to awesome. And it makes you happy. And if you, have, if you download it and you find yourself with questions or you say like, you know what? This time to awesome is not under five minutes. This is the time to pain. Then visit our community site. Ask questions, read other people's experience. I'm always on there trying to help solve problems. I think it'll make you happy. So we're always on Twitter. Uh, we have a company account. You can email me, you can tweet at me. I am always available. And I think we're gonna start the Q&A portion. All right, great. Um, we have one question here. Um, how do you solve the problem of having different start times for each day? Uh, the example given here is electricity is measured midnight to midnight each day, while gas is measured six to six in the morning each day. Uh, what does this mean to time series database setup, configuration, and usage? Uh, what I would say is that uh, generally this this isn't a problem um, if you're I mean so let me let me qualify this by saying it would depend on what you wanted out of that data so uh, for instance if you if you wanted to compare the usage numbers on things that started at different times uh, you could store them in different measurements in the database you could have gas and water separate um, so that you could aggregate them and compare the aggregates if you wanted to combine them um, that might be like a, a little bit more of a specialized query, but again, it, it would uh, depend heavily on, on sort of what you needed from that data. Generally, it's not a problem that, I, that I've seen crop up. All right. Um, next question. Uh, how is this different from Elastic? Yeah, that's a good question. Elastic is great at what it does, which is text-based search, right? It's another specialty tool for a special problem, but it's not specialized for time series. And I think that, that what's different about what we do is that Influx always had time series in mind. Elastic search is often used for it. And if you're using Elastic search and you're like super happy, then like, you know, do you, do you think. But I would say that um, we, we do have some benchmarks on our website. You can go take a look and see like, how can I um, improve my processes and my performance? Then, then Influx might be the answer for your time series problems. Great. Um, so what do you do when data does not arrive in order? Uh, for example, if a smart meter pushes data every day, but for some reason, two days are missing, one day arrives, and then further along, the missing days come in. Well, oh, that's an interesting problem. I think that what you would do, let's see, let me think about it for a second. 
So the default order in the database is time order. So I think they might still end up in chronological order. Don't quote me on that. That's like a that's a special problem that I think you, capacitor might help with because that's like a data transformation. So you could send it to the capacitor, make sure it was uh, time ordered, and then put it back into the database. But I, I'm leaning towards that. I, I think the the, the database uh, kind of forces chronological order. So it would do if the timestamps were still correct, then they would still end up in order in the database. Great. Um, what is your query language like? Um, does it have time constructs that make it better, easier than SQL? Yeah. So right now we're 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 on the cusp of greatness, as they say. So what our our language right now is uh, InfluxQL, which is a SQL-like language. Um, and while it has many similarities to SQL, the things that it differs on are its ability to sort of like aggregate and make windows and perform like special time tasks, right? And, and a big part of that is using the query language to create retention policies um, to make buckets. Like I want this in one minute intervals. Those things are, are much easier in, in FlexQL than they are in SQL. On the other hand, we, we're also working on a brand new uh, query language, which you can get as part of the newest release. Uh, or it's it's kind of in beta, but you can still use it on the open source. Uh, it's called IFQL, although the name may change as it's still kind of like undergoing work and we're taking suggestions on it. So if you wanna um, use the beta of IFQL and let us know what you think, we would love to hear it. It's a different kind of language um, that is going to be much easier to use. It's not SQL-like. It's not really anything like. <laughs> it's just our, some of our engineers really love to write new languages. And so what they've done is they've created this another specialty tool um, that's going to make it a lot easier to, for time-specific problems, especially, so that we don't have to rely on any of the constructs of SQL. Um, so I would encourage you to try both. InfluxQL has, has really great documentation. Uh, it's super easy to use, especially if you're familiar with SQL. Um, and if you use it and it's not exactly like meeting your needs, then I would uh, ask that you try the beta of IFQL and let us know what you think. Okay, uh, we have one more question here. Um, uh, how does the expiration of data work? Is there a way to insert and keep for 30 days, for instance? Yeah, definitely. So one of the, the biggest benefits of InfluxDB is that it has uh, retention policies. And the retention policies are, are built into how the database works. So if you're sending data into the database, you can create a retention policy along with it and say, I want to store this gas and water levels, but I only want to store them um, for 60 days. Uh, you can set that at the moment of, of, of write, and then you don't have to worry about it. Um, the deletion will happen automatically at the end of that retention policy. Um, that being said, you do need to also think about if you have shards, then you have a shard duration policy too, which means that uh, data is kept both in on disk and in the shard, right? So there are two different retention policies to, to think about, um, but it's super easy to set up. And the because it's one of our, I think, best features, uh, it's, the, it's one of the easiest to use. There's really great documentation on it. All right, thank you. Uh, well, that's all the questions that we have right now. Do you have any final things to say, Katie? No, just, uh, you know, thank you to everyone for paying attention and letting me talk about cake. And, you know, I, I wanna really stress that they can tweet at me or email me with, with anything they have going on. It doesn't even have to be an influx question. If you just wanna chat, uh, let me know and I'm available. Great. Well, thank you very much, Katie, for a wonderful presentation today. 
Um, I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, Influx Data, for providing the DZone audience with a great webinar. And lastly, thank you to everyone who joined us for today's presentation. We hope you learned something new today that will help you in your developer career. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.